I showed him where the keys were. Oh. I figured that was you, but like, yeah, somebody else who is also looking for coffee, so. Welcome everyone, really glad you're here. Uh, the f I'm gonna open with a bit of preamble and then introduce my dear friend, Daniel. Daniel, how long have you been attending Advent? Seven years now. Seven years now, yeah, okay. 2019, 17. 20, okay, 2017, okay. I thought it was longer. That's wonderful. Glad, so glad you're, you're with us. Uh, the philosopher Kolokowski says, a culture that loses its sense of sacrum where we get the word sacred, loses its sense entirely. And that the architecture of a given civilization can tell us a lot about its presuppositions, its ideology, its religion, um, where its great hope resides. Uh, Dostoevsky said beauty would save the world. I don't think he went for it far enough because I think we would herald that the source of that beauty is Christ alone. So we're here to uh, learn from Daniel, sit at your feet, hear what you have to say about architecture, which explores um, Eastern tradition and Western, is that right? Okay, I got, I got the memo. Why don't I open this up in a word of prayer? Okay. Heavenly Father, this is the day that you've made. We rejoice and are glad in it. I think we, uh, for those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, the sun um, has a certain radiance uh, because it's rare and because when it shows up, we get outside and can revel once again in the wonder of your creation. I thank you for your servant Daniel. I thank you for the many ways, I don't even think he knows all the ways that he has helped me keep my eyes fixed on you. He's been a real brother in the faith. Uh, guide his words by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And may we, all of us, be drawn um, more and more closer to knowledge and depth of insight through this seminar. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Let's welcome Daniel. Thank you. Let me try to, okay. Um, yes, it says to be a comparison, but I'm not gonna do any comparison this week because there's a lot to talk about the uh, Christian architecture. So this week, this Sunday, I will give everybody a quick walk through the history of the Christian architecture, which is equivalent to the history of the Western architecture. And then next week, I will talk about the Chinese architecture, a little bit about the Indian architecture, and the Japanese and Zen Buddhism architecture. And at the end, I will do a comparison. So uh, without touching on the Asian or Oriental architecture, I am not do, going to do any comparison this week. So you have to come back next week for the comparison. Okay, so today is the history of Christian architecture. I prepared my PowerPoint on a desktop, and I'm not familiar with a laptop yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I expect you know some uh, something that I do not anticipate. Uh, so you have to bear with me. Okay. Um, so when I look it up, you know what is the history of architecture. You know, I remember there was a poster, my favorite poster, when I was uh, studying architecture. But, you know, there's so many terms here. I know it's, it's so tiny that you don't see them all because I don't know all these terms too, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so just let you know, there will be so many different terms that these architects, they create, but uh, they're not that important. Okay, so uh, with the Limit time limit that we have about four or five minutes to to an hour. I uh, I wanted to focus on a few major milestones on architecture, and then uh, we will go into a little bit on some of the major ones and not all of them. Okay. All right, the year 1054 is an important year. This is where the Greek schism is all about because the. Uh, the main line of the Christianity, they split into two, you know, the Orthodox and then the Roman Catholic Church. So it becomes two camps, the uh, Eastern and the Western. However, what is more important is the theology. When I was uh, in school studying for theology, it talked about the difference between the Orthodox Church 
and the uh, Roman Catholic Church, the concept of God. Okay, uh, I think this is a good illustration. The Roman Catholic Church is always a linear: the Father, and then he gets the Son, and proceed to the Holy Spirit. So when we are going to do the uh, Nicene Creed today, pay attention. <laughs> Because the word beget is always a key word reserved for the son. And the word proceeds is always the key word reserved for, for the Holy Spirit. Okay. So if we look at this map here, this is a linear model for the Roman Catholic theology, the theology of God. But when you come to the Eastern Orthodox Church, the concept is more like you can call it a triangle or a circle, okay? Uh, you know, that the Father, you know, begets the Son, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And this is the big issue. This is what they call the philoquial <laughs> in the uh, theology term. And that makes the Eastern Church and the Western Church distinct, okay? That is also a key ingredient about the architecture of those uh, buildings for the Orthodox Church and for the Catholic Church. Okay, so let's go into it and see what happened. Okay, uh, the term Byzantine architecture says from 4th century to 15th century. Now, it's de debatable because some people don't agree. Some people believe the Romanesque architecture comes first, and some people believe the Byzantine architecture comes first. It depends on which camp you are on. If you're with the Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic would say their architecture are the Romanesque, and the Orthodox Church, they would adopt the Byzantine architecture. So these two determines a lot on what you believe in the whole architectural design. Now, um, with the Orthodox Church, uh, in some sense, the church the size is a little bit smaller. It's not that grand or big compared with the Roman Catholic Church because they have more money. So they can afford to build a more grand church and a bigger church, but not the Orthodox. Uh, folks, okay. So this is uh, one of the examples the Byzantine uh, architecture, and this one is in Bulgaria. So uh, on the Eastern Europe, you know, if we look at all these uh, church buildings, you know, look like they are surrounded by a hotel. So we know how small the Orthodox Church it is. <laughs> it's real tiny. I mean, they preserve it well, but originally they aren't that big. Okay. Now let's look at another one. This one is Istanbul. And uh, this is also not a big one. However, I want you to take a look at the, oh, not this one, the next. The, I'm going to show you the next slide is a cutaway, okay? The same church, the same church, okay? Byzantine architecture, the uh, key feature is the doom. This one. This is a doom. And it's also a term called rotunda. So what are the difference between the doom and the rotunda? Okay. The difference are, depends on what is supporting the doom. They must have some walls. Those walls, they are either circular or elliptical. If those walls go all the way to the ground, that is a rotunda, okay? If it just go on top of a structure and not all the way down, we just call it a doom, okay? So these are major difference between rotunda and the doom, okay? Now, this is also important before I introduce the next, the next slide. The next slide is, imagine you are lying down on this nose, okay, and look up to the ceiling, okay, 
and see what do you see from that church. This is what you see. Okay? So this is a, you know, there are four columns. Okay? So this one is not a rotunda because they have a column supporting it. Okay? However, they create a space here and they can look at the doom. Okay? So this is a, a Orthodox church and uh, uh, they want you to enjoy is when you look up, you will see a crucifix, a cross on the ceiling. So to appreciate the architecture, if you go to an Orthodox church, keep your head up. Always look at the ceiling, okay? If you go to the Roman Catholic church, keep your head down, look at the floor, okay? Because the crucifix is, you know, the Roman Catholic church, you will see with the tiles and everything, you know, it's on the floor with the uh, Orthodox Church is always up in the ceiling. So, I think the church design, you know, the way you appreciate the architecture, you know, you have to do, move your head in different directions in order to fully appreciate the architecture. So, this is the, uh, the ceiling that you can see, you know, if you are lying on the lyres. Now, let's go to see another. You can see, I can say, this is the most important one or the most representative of the Byzantine architecture is this uh, Pig Sophia. And uh, of course, you know, all these minarets are from the Islamic times. So our original church, it don't have the minarets, okay? But this one is truly a rotunda because they don't have any columns to support it. They just create one whole big space and you can walk under it and appreciate the doom at the top, okay? So this is the outside, it's always a beautiful one. I, it's on my bucket list. I've never <laughs> been to Turkey, always want to go. And this is something, I like to see this one and this, the next thing I want to see is the soup, you know, that you can walk across the houses on top of those <laughs> buildings. <laughs> yeah. Like in the movie International, I, I love that part of it. Okay, now this is the, the tomb of the uh, Pig Sophia. Um, um, it's not that clear, but actually you can see the image of price over here, okay? Uh, it's on my slide, but you know, the background is too bright, but you go back and you can look for it. <laughs> but this rotunda, the beauty, the beauty of this rotunda is all these light sources from all directions. And when the sun moves, all this sunlight moves in different directions. It's truly beautiful. It's truly beautiful. So this is uh, the rotunda, and this is the cross section of Hexovia. Okay, so this is one big open space. Okay, and this is vertical. So this is truly a rotunda. And we can see the, the doom on the top of it. Very delicate. And, and so the Hague Sophia, they also have the tiles. Even though the tiles are not highly decorated, but uh, because this one is a uh, Orthodox, so you always look up and appreciate the most beautiful part in the ceiling, in several on the floor. Now, if you look at it, you know the uh, the difference between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. They use the two different designs of the cross. The Orthodox Church, always the Greek cross, okay, with the four arms equal in four different directions. But with the Roman Catholic Church, it's the Latin cross. It's like a T. And this is the floor plan that is different between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so uh, it's the 
the cross that they used determined the flow plan. When I study architecture, it's not a fair story. You know, most of the time, you don't just design something that you like. All the design are always uh, bound by something. Say like if you're doing a business building, the business building, the shape of it and the form of it is determined by the parking. You know, how many parking, the floors down, how many columns do you need? And that pretty much determines how the building above ground will look like. So it's not that fair, okay? If you have a house, you may notice that the bathrooms are always back to back, right? And if you have a kitchen upstairs, a bathroom downstairs, they are on top of the other. Why? The water lines and the sewage lines. Because they want to keep this close together. They don't want to run the water pipes you know, all over the house. That is too expensive. So the bathroom and the kitchen also determine the shape and the form of your house. Because where do they locate it? By the architectural economics, that will determine the shape and the form of your house. So similarly, because of the design, they always want to have the cross to represent you know, the presence of Christ. That always determines the exterior of the church buildings. What would, how would they look like? I better get fast, you know. I haven't even get into the first <laughs> design yet. Okay, so this one is is a, a Higgsovia. Uh, it's a perspective, uh, cross section perspective. So as you can see, they have the tile, tiles, and you know, there's a lot of meticulous uh, uh, designs and details all over the building. So uh, this is a. Uh, this is something I truly, really want to see uh, with my own eyes eventually one day. Okay, let's look at another example. This one is a Romanesque architecture. Uh, from the outside, you don't really see a big difference, right? They, it's a church, you know. <laughs> What's so big deal about it? But uh, obviously, they don't have to do. This is the most obvious obvious part, apart from what we were talking about, the, uh, 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 the Byzantine architecture. Okay, but the Romanesque uh, uh, architecture is more than just uh, the outside. Because from the outside, it's pretty hard to judge the architecture. So we have to look into the inside. With the Romanesque architecture, we, I'm not going to repeat everything I wrote here. But there will be a lot of arches, a lot of columns. Okay, these are the you know just think about the Roman empires. They have their aqueduct, you know, running all over the whole Europe. You know, so what you what impressed you most are always the columns that support the aqueduct. So um, they use a lot of the uh, arches, walls, towers, and arcades here. Okay, so these are the and with the Romanesque architecture is always symmetric. Symmet symmetry, being symmetric is the aesthetics. That is the beauty, okay? The left side has to be equal to the right side. If you break that rule, that will affect the definition of aesthetics with the classical architecture. So it's always symmetric. Uh, symmetric. Okay, now, as we can see that, uh, the Romanesque architecture is all over Europe, okay? So, uh, this one is from France. The France, you know, is Catholic. It's not Orthodox anymore, okay? Um, Germany, even though when think of Germany, you think of the Lutherans. But uh, before the Lutherans, it's always Catholic. You know, if, when, if, you're, if you go to Germany today, there are quite a few, quite many of them 
are still Catholic churches. So, you know, Catholic churches are quite common in Germany. Okay? Now, you look at the outside, it is just some masonry buildings. You don't see the columns. You have to really go inside to see the, uh, the, uh, the columns. And uh, this is another church. I'm not going to pronounce because I don't know German and I don't know French. Most of these names, I don't know how to pronounce it. So just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me trust me. Now, we look at the top wheel of this church. This is a what? Latin cross. This is not a Greek cross. It's a Latin cross. It's a T. Okay? So this is one of the church. Also, I haven't seen it by myself yet. I'd love to see this one. I have quite a few image on this church. I love taking pictures at night. Okay, this is a beautiful church if you look at it at night. Of course, the feature is the tower up here. But that one is not important. That one is not important. Let's go into it. Okay, this is interior. Now, this is Romanesque. You can see all these columns. Okay, all these walls that they preserve, the arches at top of it. These are the features of the Romanesque architecture. These are the major features, okay, of this uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church. This is the cross section. I love this cross section. Okay, it shows where all these uh, low bearing walls and columns and uh, they cut away, they cut through the tower, so uh, you can see how it runs. And you see this here? They have all this Romanesque architecture is, they have all the strict lines. Strict lines is also aesthetics. Repetition of the strict lines are aesthetics in architecture. So this one is all the same. It runs all the way down, okay? So this is a cross-section. And let's look at the next one, is the Gothic architecture. Now, when we come to Gothic, this is uh, the architecture used on the churches most of the time. I don't even think too many palaces, they use Gothic architecture because because of the height of the building, okay? Which I'm gonna show you next, okay? Uh, Gothic architecture, you can say that is most of them, you can find most of the Gothic architectures in France, in France. That is the, uh, and you can see all these flying buttresses everywhere, okay? This is France. Uh, this is uh, Notre Dame, it's a very famous uh, uh, Roman Catholic church. But what is special about the Gothic architecture is the scale. When you go to an, uh, a Gothic architecture church or, or, or Basilica, as you can see the human scale compared with the whole structure, you are really looking at a divine scale. Remind you that God is an awesome God. You are next to nothing. So people tend to be humble, tend to be quiet down when they come to that building to worship instead of talking. This is using the architecture to forcefully to humble the people when they come to meet with their divine God. Okay? So the Gothic architecture is always using a divine scale. That scale is so big. Now, that's why nobody, if you, even if you have the money, you don't want to build your home in a Gothic architecture. Okay, let me tell you a stupid experience I had. <laughs> when I was an architectural student, I thought of, you know, cathedral ceiling. This is a great feature, you know, because uh, normal houses, you don't have a high ceilings. So I designed one hotel, you know, with this cathedral, 
cathedral, cathedral feelings as a special feature. And then my prof came to me and told me, you don't really want to have a high ceiling in your bathroom. It will be turned out like a Spanish acquisition. <laughs> you don't feel, you know, you'll be horrible. <laughs> you feel like you are, you are being tortured, okay, because of the height. You know, if you're praising yourself, you know, in that height, you know, you feel yourself uncomfortable. So I learned from that stupid experience after my fault point out, you don't use high ceilings when your space is too narrow. You know, when you're in your living room, high ceiling is okay, but not in a bathroom. <laughs> this is a horrible mistake. Okay. So this is why the Gothic architecture, you have to have a lot of space. You don't want to be in a, a space that crumb together because uh, it will be very stressful, okay? So um, these are the features of the Gothic architecture. Now, let's look at a few more. This one is uh, from uh, Milan, okay? It's also one of the famous Gothic architecture. Now, this one, what it says, British Gothic architecture. Just by looking at it, how does it different than the French or the regular Gothic architecture? This is British. I know it's not fair. You just look at you know, a few slides and then now another slide and I say this is British. Okay. Okay. If you don't really notice the difference, the difference is the French or the Gothic architecture that focus on the height, how, go, how high it can go up. With the British Gothic architecture, the emphasis is not on the height, it's on the length. So imagine you are in London, and if you look at the Parliament, the Parliament building in Britain is a British Gothic, and it's a long building. Repetitive, you know, all the lines repeating itself, but it's a long one. The emphasis never goes up. This is the major difference between the British uh, Gothics and the regular French Gothic. Now this is the, uh, give you the, uh, a glimpse of what the British uh, interior architecture on the British Gothic. So you can see all these uh, columns, they are all the same with the mosaic glasses, um, but the British, they always decorate their floors. So the floor, they have something to look at too, but of course they are not orthodox, so you look down. Instead of looking up, okay, look down. Okay, let's go to Renaissance. Renaissance. Renaissance happens in the year, you know, 1500s after, you know, during that period, these two major things happened. You know, the uh, 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 Martin Luther, you know, the Reformation, and then the Enlightenment is the, because of the people. They do not trust the Roman Catholic Church, uh, too much corruption there, they turn to communities and science. Okay, so those two things happened, both the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Okay, Renaissance, Renaissance architecture. What did you see the difference between the Renaissance architecture and the Gothic architecture? Came back, to, hmm? came back to a dome. It has the doom because as you notice, architecture is evolving. When they have a Renaissance architecture, that doesn't mean that I'm going to trash, you know, what the Romanesque uh, architectures were doing. They keep using them, recycle them, adopt them, keep them, okay? So the doom, not exactly the doom, but the round top and everything, they are all the same. 
they are not going to get, get rid of it. But what are the major difference between this one and the previous gossip that we look at? Look at this one. This is also a reference architecture. What are the differences? It's not like um, what's the, symmetrical. It's not symmetrical, yes. But uh, Renaissance architecture did not deny symmetrical. Okay. This is example, I, 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 you look at, this is only part of the building, so you don't see the whole thing, so you only look at part of it, it's not symmetrical. The major difference is human scale. Look at this, every floor, they delineate it with a line so obvious to let you know this is what a living space is all about. And this living space is scaled according to the human height. Okay? Because of course they are, this is a luxury building, so they are not going to just do a ceiling height of eight feet. This is only residential for us to live in. But this is it, you know? So those are the rich guys. So they want to have a ceiling much, much higher, okay? So they must have 10 or 12, but still, this is according to the human scale. And this is the difference than Gothic. Gothic is a divine scale, okay? When you walk into the restaurants, it is a human scale. So the same thing is about Reformation and enlightenment. Because at that time, during that time, those people, they believe that they have the awareness. Oh, we can do everything. The focus switched from God, from the divine God, into the human humanity. So they believe we are more important. So when we create a building, it ought to be charted and measured according to my size, according to my height and scale. You know, Ben Roy Wright, a very famous American architect, he designs more than buildings. He designs his own furnitures. But all his furnitures are quite low, lower than normal because he's not tall. So he designed all the furniture according to his own height. I don't care about you, you know, it's for me to enjoy. So he designed all the furniture are lower than regular people will use. Because this is what they focus on. This is my chair, and I want to do it on my height. The same thing for the Renaissance architecture. The focus switched from God to man. So I list out something here to hopefully can inspire you to look at the Renaissance architecture. Okay, so uh, they have the uh, all kinds of columns and dooms. Again, they are not going to get rid of the dooms. Okay, these things. They are okay too. However, they are still thriving for symmetry, okay? And uh, proportion and harmony. These are the classical rules from in architectural design. And this is the Western aesthetics that it ought to be balanced, symmetric, and in the right proportion. Okay, let's come to a rogue. Now, we look at Gothics, they are focused in France, okay? When we come to Renaissance, the table switch to Italy, okay? When it comes to Baroque, the table switch to Russia, okay? Because when you look at, it's pretty hard to find Baroque architecture in church buildings. This is a few, only a few that I could I could find. Because most of these Baroque buildings 
We've used it to build in parlors, concert halls, theaters, and not really for the, uh, for the church buildings. Baroque is because the, the, the Russians, when they came to France, they visit and see the Versailles, the palace. They like it and then they borrow it and they want to bring it back to St. Petersburg. So if you go to St. Petersburg, there will be a lot of Baroque architectures. Um, I've been to St. Petersburg, so <laughs> this one's a winter palace. And you can tell they have red, oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's too bright. You don't see all these details here, but go back to, to your home computer and look up the winter palace. It's very decorative, very, a lot of details, very meticulous. So this is the uh, Baroque architecture. Okay, not only Baroque in, in, in Russia, you know, Vatican also use it too. Look at these columns. It's not practical. You know? If we are pragmatic, you just make a straight one. Why do you order to make the spiral ones? Baroque is all, always going to details. They always make it that creative to make you appreciate the details. So Vatican also use part of the Baroque architecture. I know, because I know some people may have a heartburn if the United States is not being mentioned. So <laughs> I have to mention it. <laughs> when it comes to modern architecture, now we can talk about the United States. Okay? So uh, we'll give you a few examples like this. You know, they are all found in U.S. Okay. Now with, uh, with the uh, modernism, modern architecture, this is where symmetric is not going to be restricted. Okay. However, with the modern architecture, they are still talking about lines and curves. This is not something that you can do without. Okay. But with the modern architecture, they have the new technology. And the new technologies and the new materials are we enforce the concrete and steel. So most of the modern architecture will be using steel and glass. Okay? And modern architecture is so pragmatic. Anything that is not necessary or required, we can do away without. Okay? So if you look at, if you go to downtown, a lot of these uh, modern architecture buildings are so boring. Mm -hmm. Okay? You just look at a cold, tall glass walls or the same, the, the facade is all the same, just the windows, no variations. Kind of boring. Okay? But this is Modernism. Modernism is quite pragmatic. Anything that is not necessary, do without. Do it without. Okay? So this is modernism. However, we don't see too many churches in designing modernism. Because modernism and eventually the postmodernisms that I'm going to talk about next are we for these high rises, business buildings? Never heard of them or residential. It's most unlikely. It's most unlikely. So in order to find church buildings that can be classified as modern architecture, this is the one of the most famous building represent the modernisms by La Capucier, a French architect. Just go a little bit. Oh, I just want to see that. See it. Just yeah. you. It's okay. quite Sorry. beautiful. I really like it. Yes, they have uh, different curves and uh, they are start playing with the light. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, the I would say, it, it's one of the best representation of the modern, uh, modern architecture by La Cabossier. 
this is the interior. Look at it, you know, they make different openings, you know, and let the light pass in. And they play with the color of the light. So just by standing there, it's not a big church, it's, a, it's such a small church. You can count it. Our church can take up six times the space like this. So, but this one, when you are able to sit there and enjoy the light and the, uh, the sun in that building there, this is a wonder, um, modernist wonder. Now, when we come to postmodern architecture, postmodernisms, I haven't found one good building <laughs> in terms of a church. Okay, most of them are in uh, public buildings or business buildings. And uh, when I went to school, when the profs talk about uh, postmodernisms, this is one good representation. You know, it's not far away from here. It's the Potton Building, okay, by Michael Graves. Uh, he was still quite healthy, you know, when I went to school and studied the postmodernisms. And uh, this one is a little bit too dark, but uh, let's look at the, uh, the daytime. Now, postmodern architecture, the difference between postmodern and modernism is the architects, they come up with the ideas. They felt bad about the modernisms. Because the modernisms, they are so pragmatic. They took away everything. They stripped everything off. So they look at the building, they are so boring, then they ask themselves, what did we miss? So when we come to postmodern architecture, they want to give the top and the base to the architecture. Because classical architecture talk about buildings, they have a top, they have a body, and they have a base. But with the modernisms, they strip away the top, they strip away the base, only got the body. So they think it's a bad idea. When we come to postmodernisms, we are going to recreate again. We are going to give the top and the base back. Now, this is a typical example for the uh, uh, postmodern architecture. You know, they create something here. This this way you don't see the top that obvious, okay? But they, they give a base back here, the scale, that you know that, you know, the classical elements of architecture now comes back, okay? Now comes back. However, with the postmodern interior, there are some good examples. One of these, you know, we can look at all these are the different colors, materials, and then they are also playing with what? With the light and the shadow. This is what postmodern interior architecture is playing. The same church building in different time, it displays different colors, okay? And with different light sources, you, you, the whole field is all different. Okay. Now, you have such a good example for the interior. What do you think the exterior looks like for the postmodern? I think it's one horrible example. This is what the exterior looks like. It looks like a water tank. <laughs> you couldn't even tell this is a church. You know, how did they, some belt, you know, and you enter through this one inside. So this is not a good representation of the postmodern architecture. Okay? Okay, this is the last one. Okay. Is this the playground for the postmodern architects? Or this is an unrecognized architecture? Pretty hard to make the definition. Because with the uh, postmodern era, that we are facing right now. Everything is chaotic. This, the order, everything is uncertain. So at this point, we don't even have a good definition for the postmodern architecture for churches. We haven't found any good examples yet. We can see that 
We have church buildings that they are not symmetrical. They have uh, they have some tops, but uh, it's pretty hard to find the common things with all these elements with the postmodern approach. So this is the uh, last slide that I have, and uh, I can move with this door if you have any questions that you want to ask. We'll try my best. Yes, Gary. One, one thing that's always, in, well, not all, interested me about, though, why did they build them so tall? It reminds me of the Tower of Babel to some degree, that we build as high as we can to get as close to God as we can. Well, it depends on what style you're talking about. You know, with the Gothics, they, they want to make it tall. They want to make it tall. And do you also, did you also notice that um, in some churches in the uh, rural areas that they have a clock okay. at the top of those, uh, you know, the pinnacles of the, um, of the building, okay? Because this is the place where when the bell rings, that is a time to remind people to come and worship. So you have no excuse at saying that, oh, I lost my way, I couldn't find the church because the church building is so tall that you, you can miss it, okay? So making the church or buildings, these uh, ecclesial buildings so tall is make sure that it's large enough to accommodate the people and also you won't be get lost in finding the church. So this is, uh, I think, one way to design for those uh, high buildings. And also from an architect's viewpoint, uh, a building that is tall, you have a lot more choices to play with the variations. Okay. Yes? I also have a question. We have been to many of these that you brought up on your slides, not to Turkey, but to the churches. And I'm always sad when I go in them. A, they're empty in most of the places, especially in France. B, I love that you brought up the clock because they do it also in the middle of the day for the Angelus and the different prayers that people used to pray. Mm -hmm. And uh, thirdly, all the labor it took to build those when the people were very poor. As particularly, I don't know about the region, but we were looking at many in Italy and it, they, the guide said the people, it was their way to kind of work their way into heaven by donating their time. But you mentioned the steel beams in ours what makes these earthquake-proof? Do you know? Because there have been earthquakes and the churches have survived. Actually, I want to cover this one next week. Okay. Since you ask, since you ask, I will jump the gun. <laughs> I've often been curious. Is it the hand of God that's preserving them? <laughs> you know, in the last hundred years, we did so much experiment with all these uh, mechanics and uh, you know all the fields on the materials they were all studied so now we know how long a beam is required to support so much weight okay so nowadays because we have the math to calculate to find out what is the minimum or the maximum that we need to carry the load, okay? If you are the owner to build that building, will you just keep the minimum or the maximum? It depends on how much money I have, I think. <laughs> <laughs> to well, be honest. depends on your, how much money, but if you know your money, your budget is not limited, yeah. you will go with the lowest, right? As long as the building code requires that, 
I'll just meet that requirement and that's it. By law, all I need is to meet that building code is defined. So anything that happens if earthquake or anything that happens, that will cause the building to crumble. But before they have the math, like in, in Renaissance time or before the Gothic time, like in architecture, in Chinese architecture, we, they didn't have the math to calculate what the requirements are. Yeah, we not this engineer. He's an engineering <laughs> engineer. So what do they do? Visually. They do the visual check. If I think that is not safe enough, I make it bigger. Okay? So say like I don't know how much the load upstairs is, you know, for this building. I look at, you know, the other temples, they have a column that thick, that big that much of diameters, okay? If I'm not certain and I want to avoid earthquake or, earth or anything that may happen, I'll make it bigger. I'll cut a, a bigger tree. So the margin of error for those ancient buildings are quite high. That means, you know, they make sure, you know, that it will bear all the load that they anticipate or they did not anticipate. They make it so big, the margin error is you won't be able to make that mistake easily. That's why most of these uh, Chinese pagodas, you know, that they last for over 700 years, a thousand years, they still stand. Because they didn't do the math. Without the math, they would just make it bigger. So that is the same factor. Yes? It's been wonderful to watch these, view these buildings through the lens of the man who's a musician and how so clearly these spaces are made for corporate worship, yeah. for singing, and uh, the acoustics are reliable and spectacular when you raise those walls and create that kind of cavernous space. So um, thinking about function, the function is worship and the function is corporate worship. So we can sing together and actually join that kind of angelic chorus. It's wonderful to watch. Oh, okay. So it's not fashion. Okay. <laughs> On dovetailing off of that point, I wonder if the acoustic quality of postmodern churches has been lost. That the shape, and so they've gone so much in the direction of trying to work with shape that it doesn't have that uh, resonating cavity that the cathedrals have. Yeah, I. I don't know, but all I know is modernism and postmodernism, symmetric is not required. So if you don't have a symmetric in the geometries, how can you converge the sound? That is questionable. That's questionable. I think it's again a reliance on technology. You have to go over to microphones and speakers and I don't think so actually. If it's if a place is designed for worship or a concert hall, it's very intentional now, the sound. Like at Benaroya when they designed that, you could just hear a pin drop. Um, so I think that we leverage the modern architecture, we leverage our knowledge for that. Because I used to be in these choirs and, and some of the new buildings are good. Some of them are bad, like you know, Protestant churches notoriously bad because they aren't really built for that. But if it's built for that, I think they, yeah, they do. Yeah, but then the counterexample is um, Lincoln Center with their Philharmonic Hall, which they tried three or four times to get the clouds right, to get the sound right in the concrete tomb, and they, they're still trying to dial it in. So Interesting. But you're right, the old buildings are so great for singing. It's really fun to sing those old songs in the big old building. I wouldn't know. I didn't sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes back to what Daniel was talking about. It, it boils back down to math. Because yes, acoustics yes. and lighting and everything all are, you know, very measurable. And you can build a model of any kind of surface 
and say where the sound's going to end up and what volume it is and what light it's going to be. So it, it is a, it all goes back to the statistics and the math that goes into that, whether it's a model basis or a physical basis. Mm -hmm. And it's also the surface conditions that go in. There's a lot of that goes into that. I do have a question in the Gothic one. Why the gargoyles and all the yeah. devils and everything all around the outside? In of the Notre churches? Dame, especially. Notre Dame had gargoyles all the way around the perimeter. Yeah. For the water. I thought it was to keep the devil away or something. It's for water. <laughs> no, so, you know, the, the waters can drain oh, through the nose part. Kind of creepy when you walk through something. Yes, <laughs> it's ugly, but it's for water drainage. Okay. Oh, it's for water drainage. Thank you. Okay. Not only I don't sing, just like the uh, shorts, you know, the, uh, the German chanson, <coughs> I don't dance either. <laughs> So don't ask me questions I you know, that'd be a great place to dance. I don't know. <laughs> well, let's thank Daniel for the presentation. Okay. That was a magisterial survey of not just the architecture, Daniel, but the theological underpinnings that guide those architectural decisions. Um, we're all recipients of the modern tradition. I'm a student of T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland, a famous poem from 1922 where he laments that the nymphs have de departed. And the nymphs have departed, that's his refrain. That so much of our aesthetic sensibility has fled the imagination. So Daniel, thank you for reinvigorating that in us, giving us a sense of the way that beauty participates in the salvation hope that we proclaim. So many people I know have come to faith, not through five reasons to believe, but through an aesthetic experience of God's grandeur. I have a friend who became a believer through the plays of Shakespeare. I have a friend who uh, entered the Louvre and was overcome by a depiction of Jesus. So I love that we're a church that is serious about aesthetics, that actually believes that the Holy Spirit can use beauty to draw people to himself. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the world that you've made, uh, that it's inaugural, you declare that it was very good. Uh, there's, the world is so broken because of sin and rebellion and death, and yet there's so much to love within it. And I pray that those loves, the love for architecture, for music, for painting, would ultimately draw us to you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.